Hey everybody, it's Vanessa the Crafty Gemini and I wanted to start a new Knitting 101 tutorial series here on my YouTube channel for you because so many of you are asking me to teach you how to knit. There are thousands of different knitting tutorials on YouTube, but I'm going to go ahead and give you all my version. I'm pretty new to knitting, but I am obsessed. I wanted to share with you a couple projects I'm currently working on. Well, this one is done. This is a finished hat that I just made. It only took me a couple days to whip this up, and it, it wasn't even like a sit down and knit the whole way through. It's a little here, a little there. Then I finished it up on a flight uh, as I was coming home from Denver this past week. So this is a hat I made for my husband. I didn't follow a pattern. I kind of just created it and winged it as I went. I have made him hats before, so I already know he has a bigger head. I know how many I need to cast on for him. And then I decided to go with this kind of fun blend of colors for this striped look. And I just chose a couple different colors and then just counted out the different rounds as I went and knitted them. So there's black here and then I finished off the decrease round at the crown in the black also alternating with grays, this kind of navy color and the green. So pretty simple beginner friendly hat. It is knit in the round, okay? So here's another project that's knit in the round and this is my weekender sweater. This is a pattern by Andrea Maori. And it's super hot right now. It has been for a couple of years, I would say. But last year, since I was new to knitting, I would have never tried to tackle something like this. So now I'm really happy that I have. It's pretty beginner friendly. I'm not gonna say the whole thing because I haven't gotten up that way. But it is knit from the bottom up. So this is the bottom hem. This is a, lot, a slightly longer hem on the back. And this is a ribbing, so it has a little bit more stretch. It has this really cool faux seam going down the center front and center back super fun and i'm using this fun gray yarn that has speckled coloring throughout that i picked up at houston fiber fest this year from an indie dyer named night owl fibers and if you're new to knitting i wanted to show you a project that's like in the works so you can see some of the things that i have in place that help me know where i am every time i set the project down and then pick it back up so i'm pretty much done with the body here i just stopped because i need to reference the instructions again to see what the next step is but here i'll show you this part you see these cute little things i have dangling here on some different points of my project these are called stitch markers some are progress keepers the ones that i have going down the center here tell me hey, I'm getting to the center, so I need to do the stitch combination that I need to continue making this little faux seam going down the middle. So it needs to be positioned in the exact same center half, right? Center of the front and center of the back every time I work my way and get there. So it has to be in line. So I have a marker in the front and the back here to mark those areas where I need to stop and do that. And then the one that I have here is my beginning of round. So every time I pass this stitch marker, I slip it right into the same position that it was. And that tells me, hey, you did one full round. After I pass it, I'm beginning another round. Because it's in the round, it's hard to tell exactly where you are, right? Like uh, if it's like one round new or where the new round begins. So this is just a great way to keep track of each individual round as I go. And then on the other side here, I just have my needles coming out. There is a cable running through here and it goes all the way like this. This is what we call circular needles. And that is what we use when we're knitting something in the round. All right, you can also knit stuff flat on circulars, but typically this is what you'll see it most often used for. Something in the round, like a hat, a scarf, a cowl, that's not knit flat and then seamed together. If you're doing it all in a circle like this, round and round you go, Circular needles are definitely a go-to for that. One more thing about this sweater, which is cool construction technique here, and I think it would be fun even for beginners to still see. I'm knitting it like this. So all this is just knit stitches, knit stitches, all the way around and around and around as you go. And when I get to that stitch marker, then I know, hey, I need to do the little combination that I have to do here to get that faux seam, and I keep going. But it's being knit inside out. Okay, although I'm seeing this part as I knit, the finished sweater will be worn the way I showed you before, flipped this way. And the reason for that is because typically knit stitches are what people prefer to knit over pearls. And so if you had to purl every single round as you went, just so that this could be the pretty side as you knit around, uh, it would take a really long time and I don't know that a lot of people would want to tackle that knitting the knit stitch itself is a lot faster So that's why the designer made a great choice I think here and having us knit it wrong side out inside out. Okay, 
So that is the pretty side of how the finished uh, sweater will look, but I'm just showing you the construction technique, which is inside out, which is pretty cool, I think. All right, so with this new series, the idea is I'll start you off super, super basic. We're talking about yarn, the different put-ups of yarn, whether it's a cake or a hank like this or a skein that you bought from a big craft store or an online source. Different things that you need to know before you can get started, which a lot of times we just assume beginners know, but I will be sticking to the way that I like to teach things, and that is covering every single little step from the beginning. All right, so these projects were worked in the round. Now let's jump into it, talking a little bit about the yarn and how I like to wind my yarn, because it needs to be wound into something that you can work from directly before you can actually start your project. For our first video in my new intro to knitting series, let's talk a little bit about yarn, okay? But it's important to note the different put-ups, meaning the different ways that you can buy yarn in, and which ones you can start knitting or crocheting directly from, and which other ones you can't. So if you go to a big box store or some online sources, you'll find something that looks like this, like a skein. When it's wound up like this, you can start crocheting or knitting from it immediately, whether by pulling it out from the center or by removing the band and just finding the end that's exposed on the outside and start working from it that way. Here's another example of that. This started coming around, so I just like rewound it, but you see how this is one tail end of it. I could just start working from it right off of that, okay? So that's one type of put up in a skein like that. If you go to a local yarn shop or something or a place that sells uh, kind of more high-end yarns, whether it be because they're hand-painted or indie dyed, meaning an independent fabric, or fabric, <laughs> can you tell I sew? An independent yarn dyer has dyed it in a very unique manner, like this one here. This has speckles, some kind of, uh, kind of splashes of different colors all throughout. You will typically find it put up like this, into this type of a skein or a hank, sometimes they're called. You cannot start crocheting from it when it's like this, okay? Here's another example. Here's another example. When they're like this, you have to wind it into a cake, a center pull ball, so that then you can smoothly and easily work from it this way. So these we wound up because we have a uh, swift, a yarn swift, and a ball winder. These we wound, my kids and I dyed these. So I think Allie dyed this one, my son dyed this Pokemon inspired one, Pikachu inspired one, and then I used leftover blue that she had in her dye bath and added uh, a more fuchsia color. So I have some blues, reds, pinks, and all that in mine. So then we wound it up into a cake, so now they're ready to use, okay? So this is a center pull ball, so you just keep pulling from it, and it, usually you won't have any tangles if you do it this way. Whereas if you have a big hank like this, and this I got from Blueprint, so I'll include a link below where you can find some really good and affordable options online for some good quality yarn. And I'll put that link in the description box. This is what it looks like. If you start trying to crochet or knit from it like this, I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 it's gonna get tangled. This is a nightmare. There are a lot of different ways that you can wind it. If you don't have a swift and a ball winder, you can do another YouTube search for some of those options. You can have somebody hold it up for you as you wind it into a ball by hand and just have them put their hands like this as you go around and pull. But there are some ties that the Hanks have so that it keeps it pretty separated at this point. From here, we would put this around our yarn swift and then attach it to our ball winder and wind everything up into a nice center pull ball like these. Then I would be ready to start using it, whether for crochet or knitting or whatever other craft I want to use it for. So this is my Swift. It kind of looks like an umbrella. It works like this. They come in plastic, wood, all different kinds of uh, ways that you can get it. I really like using this one because I can unscrew it here, slip it into a tabletop, and then re-screw it up to hold it tight, and that's how I'll install it on the side of this table here. If you're interested in one like this, I'll include a link in the description box below on where you can find the exact same one that I'm using here. All right, tighten it up a little bit, and now it's anchored to the table. Now I'll take my hank here, I'm gonna hike this up, I unscrewed it, so now this kind of area here is loose. So the way you do it is scoot it up, to where you want it to be, then bring this up and then tighten it. That will lock the opening of the Swift in place, okay? 
Then I'll drape my yarn over it, trying to minimize the amount of kind of twists. And you can see that it's gonna fall off because this is wider than what I opened up my Swift to be. So all you gotta do is hike it up a little bit. Let me readjust this. And then I walk around, and you see how this is kind of twisted here? Just smooth it out so it's flat the whole way around. And I can probably stand to bring it up even a little bit more. Okay. You put the yarn in between these two peaks here, just like that. Now I'll find my ties and I'll cut them. They're usually either a different color, you can tell that it's a different material from your yarn. So just work your way around. Depending on the manufacturer, you might find that you have two or three or more of these. One of them is gonna be the tie as well as the beginning and the end of the yarn itself. So you can see how this is my tie, but it's tied here. So I'm gonna cut through both of everything, get rid of the tie, and you usually will then end up with one that's on the outside and one end that's on the inside. And I wasn't really paying attention to see where the other end dropped. So let me see if I can get it here. All right, well maybe it's far on the inside. The key thing is to have one on the outer edge that you can start working from. So now let me set up my ball winder and you can see how this is gonna be removed off of the bigger hank of yarn here and we're gonna wind it into a cake. All right, so here's the ball winder that I have and love. It's pretty heavy, it's all metal here and I've had some other ones in the past like lightweight ones that are all plastic, but I find that this one gives me more consistent results. So again, if you're looking for a good ball winder, I'll include a link in the description box below. This also has the same clamping type of system that the Swift did. I'm gonna slip my table in here, then I'll turn this to cinch it in place and tighten it up. We're coming down to the end. Once it pulls all the yarn off the Swift, you can stop the Swift and your cake is done. Because I held the one end at the top, there's like a little slit in the top here, that's gonna be my center pull. So I'll start working whenever I start knitting or crocheting from this end. You'll have one that just ended up off the sides. I hold the cake with two hands like this that bit that's on the side, you can choose to work either from that end or this one. A lot of times we like to start from the center pull because the ball will stay steady as we pull the yarn from it. Whereas if you're pulling from the outside, it's gonna be like rolling around everywhere as you pull from it. So it's a matter of personal preference. I just usually take this outer tail and tuck it in somewhere to keep it from wanting to come out on me. And that way I know that the one loose end I have coming from the center is the one I'll be working from. All right, so once we wind our yarn into the cake, now we're ready to start working with it. So it is pretty quick and easy for the setup, but it is a bit of an investment to get a ball winder and a Swift. So play around with it. When you first start off, you know, feel free to just use two chairs or have somebody's arms to hold the hank open for you. And then you can just start winding it into a ball, which will obviously take longer, but it's also free. And to recap terminology wise, I find that a lot of terms get kind of interchanged, but visually I want you to see what it looks like and which one of these put-ups you can start working directly from. We said skeins, you can, okay? Some companies will already have them into a ball. If it comes in a crisscross, whether it's on a skein like this or in an actual ball, then typically you can just start working from it directly. When you see it in this kind of figure eight twist, all right, these are hanks, Sometimes they call them skeins because people just assume that everybody knows that they still need to wind this into a center pull ball. But those figure eight twists, if you undo it, that's how you end up with the open hank like that. So if it looks like a figure eight, you already know, you probably won't be able to just start working from it directly. 
And then here we have the cakes or the center pull balls or center pull skeins. But if it looks like this, then yes, you can start working directly from it. If it has a figure eight shape, you cannot. You need to wind this into something first without risking the, the tangles. And then like this from a company, whether at a big box craft store or online, you can work directly from also. A brief overview here on understanding yarn weights. I just wanna give you the visual. This is categorized as a one often, it's a fingering weight. This one here is DK weight or often categorized as a size three. There should be one in the middle here, size two, which is a sport weight. Then here we have a uh, worsted weight, typically categorized as a number four. And here we have here in the bulky one, this is super bulky. So there's actually one that goes in between here, categorized as a five as bulky. And then this would be the super bulky. Just so you understand a little bit that there are varying thicknesses and weights to the yarn. There's also varying textures. This one here has kind of a little halo to it. It's like a little bit fuzzier. You can see how light and fuzzy it is, which can be a little bit more difficult for beginners to begin with. I typically start off more in this thicker range and then work my way down so that I don't get kind of overwhelmed by feeling like I'm working on the project a lot but not seeing much progress because the yarn is so thin. This is a nice one. You can get some good stitch definition because you can see the twist in the plies. Here also a nice twist. I like yarns like this. They still have a smooth finish but I can see the twist in it. I find that I get really good uh, stitch definition in ones that are like that. And then this one, you can also see the twist, but it's also a super bulky, so it looks even more textured. Would be great for using in like uh, puffy cowls or scarves or hats and things like that also. If we're talking about knitting, I typically will start off somewhere in this range, a three, four, or five. So DK weight, worsted weight, or bulky or super bulky thicknesses for your first or second projects. This would be good because the bigger and thicker the yarn, the quicker the project tends to work up, especially if you're not making a huge blanket. So I like to have uh, quicker results, more success, and that way I kind of keep the momentum going to want to tackle the next project. All right, so if we're working with this yarn here, let's have a look at what the tag tells us that it is. It's 100% superwash merino wool, so it's all 100% wool. Superwash means that it won't felt when you wash it. It means that the yarn has gone through a process where this finished project that I make with this yarn will be machine washable. Otherwise, if you're working with 100% like natural wool that has not been superwashed, you'll want to hand wash it. Otherwise, if you put it in a washing machine, especially if you put it like on a hot water temperature setting and the agitation of the washing machine with that added heat, typically you'll end up with a felted sweater at the end, if it's a sweater, right? You'll end up with felted wool instead of the project that went into the washing machine. So when it says superwash, that means that you can machine wash it and it won't felt. There are a lot of other considerations to take into mind if you're using a superwash wool, but we're just gonna keep it basic here. Here I see the classification in the yarn ball is a number three, that's a DK weight. And it tells me how many yards and meters are included in the one uh, ball that I've wound here, how much the weight is, there's 100 grams. And then for knitting needles, it tells me to use a US size six or four millimeter needle if we're looking at metric. And then a crochet hook, it's giving me, these are just recommendations as a guideline for what size needles or hooks they recommend you use for this yarn. That does not mean that you have to use these size needles and hooks. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a future video when we talk about a gauge, but just know that this is just a guideline. This does not mean that you absolutely have to use these sizes when you're working with this yarn. So for crochet hooks, it's telling me a, U, a, a US H hook or five millimeter crochet hook. And for the needles, we said a US size six or four millimeter. 